This whole room is um, chilled, but this machine is actually liquid cooled. So we have a chiller on the roof that pipes cold water down to the computer, um, exchanges it for uh, Freon, and Freon is pumped through the cabinets to keep the circuitry cool. It's actually a transistor-based supercomputer, so it's all run off individual transistors, not integrated circuits. Right. Um, it predates that, and uh, I can actually show you. Um, so each logic module has 62 of individual transistors mm -hmm. um, in this really unique construction called cordwood construction where you have two boards on either side, right. the components running between. Uh -huh. um, this is one of Seymour Cray's innovations. Um, made a really compact circuit. Right. This plugs into one of the 12 chassis, and the front of this is aluminum and is chilled um, through the Freon that's circulating through the cabinet and wow. keeps it cool. So how many of these away. units are inside the supercomputer? Uh, about 9,000. 9,000 like this? <laughs> yeah. And how much computing power is in here? Well, there's um, 62 switches is all, uh, so not very much. So 62. each one is literally an on-off switch of those. So each of those make up different types of gates. So, so in a current, in gates. a current like uh, processor for for like an, an x86 machine. Sure. How does this compare? What fraction of the uh, power? About a millionth as much power. So <laughs> your phone is about two million times the power of this supercomputer. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, yeah. how, but at the time, it was ten times more powerful than any other computer uh, that was created at the time. So it was a pretty uh, unique thing. It's also, uh, and actually, when it, when when it breaks, our engineers um, have to replace individual transistors. So they've wow. created a tool to reach down into the middle and thread them in. And then we've oh also had to reverse engineer these, and now we're reproducing these ourselves, which is kind of remarkable because none of the software that exists to draw these circuits, take into account the fact that you'd have the cordwood construction. Mm -hmm. So um, our principal engineer, Bruce, who's been working on this, literally has to print out transparencies and hold them up to the window to see if they match up, because the software won't do it. Oh my <laughs> so, how, many, how many machines like this are still in existence? One. This, this one. is it? This is it. Wow. This is the only running CDC machine of this nature um, in the world. How much do you figure it's worth? Um, either nothing or everything, <laughs> so it's the only one. There's no comparison, right, you know. Right, right. Um, we've spent considerable um, resources to get this running, obviously, um, because it is such a unique piece, and it is the first supercomputer, and it did eventually launch Cray supercomputers. Uh, so Seymour Cray, who designed this, went on to design you know, a whole series of Cray machines. What sorts of problems, uh, computer problems, were addressed on this machine initially? So they actually did a lot of the research under the common cold was done on this machine, was at Purdue University, um, as well as um, nuclear physics research, obviously cryptography. Um, so a lot of government-related projects certainly ran through this. At the time, the National Science Foundation ran a consortium of, of supercomputers that allowed access to academics and others to the machine. So uh, they were timeshare machines, so multiple people can log on to this machine at the same time. And we do offer accounts on this machine to people who want to log in remotely. And people can still do useful work on this machine? By telling that, I mean, define useful. I mean, they can do what work is interesting to them, uh, or reproduce work from their, you know, days as a student, um, or just kind of try to figure out what it, how it was that this machine was even set up and how it was used. So but a lot if, of more historically oriented programs. But if you tried to run like a deep learning or neural network, <laughs> anything like that, this doesn't have anywhere near the computing power, right? It would take a long time to do those kinds of things for this yeah. computer. And it is all core memory, too, is the cool thing. So it's all running on core memory, which oh are tiny little God. magnets. This is what so used to that's be That's 4K. RAM. This used to be RAM. It's actually little donuts of metal. Yeah. Each that one are of those is a bit. So each one of those round um, magnets is a bit. When power is applied to it, the polarity flips. So then it's a 1. When the power is flipped the other way, the polarity flips, and now it's a 0. Um, so that's 4K of memory right there. So 4,000 magnets. 4K of memory. Uh, hand woven. Um, so. Yeah, so primarily um, women in the factory um, wove these. Um, we have some great photographs from, from the factory of people with basically a microscope and, and, and weaving core memory. And that's why these machines were millions of dollars, because you, you can imagine all the labor that went into creating them. And this was the only form of volatile memory that the machines had, right? At that time, it was the most reliable. There were other things that were tried, um, you know, mercury delay tubes and things like that, but they didn't really, weren't really nearly as reliable as this. And this is not particularly reliable. We lose modules quite a bit. Really? Uh, we'll be reverse engineering these shortly. Well, yeah, each one is handmade and a ha an iron core donut yep. with wire around it. Yep. So yeah. it's wire fragile. Two axes. Wow. And every time you read it, it wipes out the memory and they have to rewrite it too. So just the act of reading it actually will take the memory out of it generally with these as volatile memory. So, so it's yeah. really volatile. Yeah. <laughs>
So this is a uh, 405 high-speed card reader. So a card deck will get placed uh, there, and then when Bruce hits the magic button, it'll very quickly read that deck of cards. So let's see. We are still working on this machine, so. We have a couple engineers here who actually um, all morning have been uh, tuning it. Apparently needs a little more tuning. So that stack of cards represents an instruction set, right? Yeah, this would be a program. This would be, you know, somebody um, actually inputting their program into the machine. It would, it would put it into the memory of the machine, and then it would be batched. So we would, whenever the operating machine wanted to run that, they would run it. So they're in the control. Um, normally, nobody would be let into this room. So the run, people running the machines would really um, control the space. And so you would leave your deck of cards outside the room in a rack. They would bring them in. They would run them, put them into the machine and run your program when they felt like it, um, and then give you a printout that would be either the results you're expecting or just saying you had an error. And then you'd have to go back through all of those cards to figure out where your error was. So a very time-consuming process. So, so when timeshare computers came along, you know, where people could log on from a terminal and do what we call interactive computing, where you type something and it gives you immediate response, that was a huge right. you know, benefit. And uh, that really allowed a lot quicker turnaround in programming and you can iterate on things, try different things out. Right, and people used to like walk around with like giant stacks of cards. This was their like PhD dissertation or their giant yeah, research project, a three foot stack of cards and if the wind came up or they yep. tripped, yes. what did they do? They'd have to uh, sort them all again and so you know they would actually, you would have a way to um, number your cards and you would actually go through and put them all back in order. Um, everybody from that era has some horror story about yeah. either losing their cards, dropping their cards, something happening to them. Absolutely. And so it was, it was nice when we moved on past that era. No kidding.